So in this video, I'll be explaining my solutions to Code Forces round 627. So starting from A, if you look at the sample case, so first test case, what we can do is we can simply just add two blocks here, and then we can just cancel out these three rows, and then everything will be empty. However, if you look at the second uh, test case here, and we can cancel out this row. And we're left with uh, this block here. And we, we want to try to cancel it. So we add three blocks here. And then we can cancel this row. But what happens is we have an empty space here. So then we just add another space here and we can cancel this row. But then we're left in the same situ situation again where we have a single block here. So. The reason why we can't fix this is because the parity of the heights of these columns are different. And since we can only add blocks of height 2, that means that we can never make the parity of the heights of these columns the same. So in fact, the condition for this problem is, the answer is yes if all of the parities of the heights are the same. So if like 1, 1, and 3, they have the same parity, so the answer is yes. And if uh, there are heights with different parities, like 2 and 1, then that means the answer is no. So the code is pretty simple here. So I just input all the elements, and then I have two booleans to keep track of if this is for checking if even element has occurred, and this checks if an odd element has occurred. And if both parities have occurred, then the answer is no. And otherwise, the answer is yes, because only one um, parity has occurred. Okay, for, so for the second problem, uh, if we have some uh, palindromic some subsequence, notice that the first and the last element must be the same. So if we don't have two, a pair of elements which are the same, and they also have, and they also need to have a. Uh, they they also can't be adjacent, or else it won't be a length. It won't have a length of at least three. So, if we can't find a pair such that these conditions are satisfied, then Wait, um, okay, so if we can find a palindromic subsequence with length at least 3, then that means there's a, a pair such that uh, there's a pair ij such that s of i is equal to s of j, and then i, um, i is not adjacent to j. So for example, uh, this is i and then this is j. So if uh, so if we can't find such a pair, then the answer must be no because any subsequence which is a palindrome with length greater than three must create such a pair. Okay, so now we just need to prove that if we do have a pair, then there must be a palindromic subsequence. And this is true because if we have, let's say we have i here and j here, and then these are both a's, and then and then they are not adjacent, so there's some characters in between. Then what we can do is we can pick run one random character. Um, let's say we can just pick x, and then so then a x a will be the pound will be a palindromic subsequence of length 3. So in my code, what I do is I um, calculate, I store the, I calculate the first occurrence of each element uh, the, for each value. So I input the elements of the array, and if the element did not occur before, then I set the first occurrence to this index. And then otherwise, I check that the first occurrence is not adjacent to the current element 
And if it's not adjacent, then that means we found uh, a pair. And then if we find a pair, then the answer is yes. And otherwise, the answer is no. Okay, so for problem C, um, we want the minimum possible value of D. And notice that if a certain D works, then all values greater than D will also work. So that means we can use uh, binary search by answer. And we'll we'll binary search on we'll perform binary search on D. So then the second thing to note is that uh, using the left is using the left cell is useless because for example in this case uh, what we can do is we can have the frog just jump to this right cell and not use this left cell. So, um, so our frog should only jump to uh, right cells. Uh, yeah, so, so we should only need to consider the cells which go to the right. And then this gives us a very simple greedy algorithm. So, so in order to check if a certain x works, what I do is I, the frog starts at position negative one. And then if the frog can reach the end in one move, then I return true. Otherwise, the frog can travel x steps. And then I check if the next any of the next x cells are equal to r. And if we find a cell which uh, goes to the right, then we set that as our new cell. And then we set this b equal to 1 so that we won't a return impossible and if we don't find any right cell that means we can't go any further to the right so that means we should uh, return uh, return false and then the main code here basically uh, I just input and then it's just binary search here and the limits are the smallest possible d is 1 and the largest possible d is n plus 1 okay so for d um, what I did was uh, I just wrote down the inequalities and then I uh, rearranged the inequalities. So now we find that um, this needs to be true. Yeah, so we find we're trying to find the number of pairs that satisfy this equation and this equation, and you might notice that this is uh, very similar to uh, counting the number of inversions in an array. So what we'll do is we'll store, we'll iterate through j, and then store all of the values of the i, which is smaller than j. We'll store of these values in the set and then or in order to find the number of values which satisfy this condition what we'll do is uh we'll, we'll just query the, we'll use an order statistics tree to query the number of elements less than this in log n time so an order statistics tree in c is uh, pbds and you can search that up if you don't know it but but so that this uh, ordered set supports order of key, which returns the number of uh, elements in the set less than this. So that's why I use to count this. And then notice that I don't use, I don't just use like int. I use a pair because the order set it can't it can, um. All the elements need to be unique in the order set, but then for different i, this value might be the same. So I make these uh, elements distinct by adding the index into the pair. So since the index of each element is different, then the elements in the set will be unique. Okay, then yeah, what I do is I just iterate for i from zero to n minus one, and then. I maintain the set of these. So after I calculate the answer for a certain i, I add this value into the set. 
so that it can be queried for future the for uh, iterations in the future. Yeah, this is very similar to inversion count counting. So you should learn that if you have not. For E, the problem statement is a bit confusing. So I think it's better to just uh, look at the code. So uh, I'll just briefly ex explain what DP of I of J is. It means the max number of good sleeping times for the uh, for the first I sleeps and we end at our J. So at first I set everything uh, to a very small value. So this is basically negative infinity. And then the base case is when we process zero sleeps and we start at time zero and then the number of good sleeps is just zero. And what we do is we process all the elements in A and then for each element, uh, um, in order to transition, we have two cases. We can either add A of I minus one or we can just add A of I. In each case, what we do is we find the new uh, hour for, we, we find the starting time for the time that um, he sleeps and then that'll be our new hour for the state. And then we take the maximum of the dp value with our current dp value and then we check if the the starting time of the sleep is in is within the range l2r and if it is then this condition will be true so it'll evaluate to one and it'll, it'll add one to the dp and if it eval evaluates to false then it'll just it, it won't add anything so yeah, we go through both cases and we update the maximum and then uh, for the final answer, we just, we don't care about which hour it ends at. So we just take, we just iterate through all the possible hours and then take the maximum of the first, the DP values for the first n sleeps, which is all of the sleeps. Yeah, okay. So for F, for if the first thing we need to do is, uh, because we have we don't maximize this, we should replace each white node with the value one. So these nodes will have a weight of one, and then the black nodes will replace them with a uh, weights of negative one. So these nodes uh, will have a weight of negative one. Then what you want to do is, um, for each uh, for each vertex v, you want the maximum weight. If we choose a subtree, uh, if we choose a subgraph of the given tree that contains the vertex v. So for for that, we need to use a dp. So dp of u is the maximum weighted subgraph. Uh, containing u in the subtree of u. And this dp is pretty easy to calculate. So uh, at first, so DFS1 calculates these dp values. And so at first, uh, the a stores the weight of the node. So when I input a, if a is equal to zero, then that means it's a, it's a black node, and then I set the weight to negative one. So at first, the the weight of the subgraph is just the weight of the node. And when we process a child, we first we uh, DFS on a child in order to calculate the DP value of the child. And then there are two cases for the child. We can either include the subgraph with the child, or we can just not include the subgraph with the child. And it would, in order to find the maximum possible weight, we just take the maximum of these two cases, and then we add that to our DP of U. And then, but then this only, this DP gives us the, uh, the max weight 
in the subsheet view. But then in the problem, we want the answer for each vertex. And we, we don't want to restrict the vertex to, we don't want to restrict the subgraph to only be in the subtree. So what we need to do is we need, um, this is a standard technique for DP on trees where we, uh, where we uh, change the, uh, the root of the tree each time in a second depth first search. So here I have my, so um, what I mean is that, wait, yeah, so when starting from DFS2, When I go down to this subtree, I basically, uh, I basically, uh, pretend like this, uh, this new node, node two becomes the root. So then I pretend like the tree becomes like this. And then if, and then if like the tree is like this and the subtree of node two is just the entire tree. So the, uh, the new value of dp of 2 will be the answer for 2. So um, pd will basically, um, pd is similar to the dp values for, for the children, but instead pd stores the values which comes from the parent of the node. So at first for the root, the PD value is zero because the node, the root doesn't have any parent. And then for each node, the answer will be the value in the, the total weight in the subtree added to the weight of the subgraph from the parent. And then when we DFS, when we DFS into the child, we need to um, update the value that's, that comes from the parent. So the value which comes from the parent is just the answer for u subtracted by the contribution of the subtree of v, which is uh, the max of dp of v and zero, like in from here. And then for the maximum weight from the parent, we can also have it make it empty. So we take the maximum of this value with zero. And yeah, this is pretty much it for F. So if if you haven't uh, learned this type of DP on tree yet, then I think uh, I think this is actually a I think you should uh, read about that first and then uh, use this problem as a, a practice problem because this is I think this is a pretty good. A problem for a beginner who just um, learned uh, this type of DP. So um, if you have any questions about my explanations, then uh, feel free to uh, ask them in the comments below so that I can help you and I can improve as well. And if you um, like this video, then feel free to like and subscribe.